one of the most popular videos on your YouTube channel. Can you expand on that and tell us what these rules are, why you think they are important? And is it just for healthcare or is it something that <laughs> um, someone like me that is not a healthcare professional can also, <laughs> can right, also since, implement? Since, since you asked, I'm going to let you in on the secrets that I haven't said on my YouTube channel and on my website and blogs. Um, those 10 rules, while I've written them practically for doctors and healthcare professionals, because those are my main audience, um, the secret is this. Anyone could actually apply those rules and adapt it for themselves and it can help them to maximize their finances even if they weren't a doctor they weren't a healthcare professional and i, I can i can touch a bit on those rules um yes please what i would <laughs> want you to do is tell me like your top three when i say your top three i mean the ones that have um made the biggest impact for you personally out of those those rules all right so so here's how i think about it um moses had the ten commandments right so these are, these are because I thought, well, it's not quite high up there. So I just made the rules and um, basically those 10, if you apply them, I think they can make quite a remarkable difference. And then um, number one is still number one, which I think is number one is without number one, you can't really do very much is to be your own chief financial officer. Um, so your your own money manager, your your own chief financial officer. Once you get to realize that nobody is coming to save you, the government is they might plan a pension or whatever, but um, you still need to take charge of your finances. Currently, we're trying to we're working on developing some sort of like program for doctors and healthcare professionals just to help them to understand pensions and make choices better. Um, but previously people were people would say, oh yeah, I've got an NHS pension. But now we just mentioned it within a few um, hours, we had over 100 people who are indicating interest in this. So number one is you are your own chief financial officer. And what that means is that you take charge of your finances. It means that you wear that hat. Even if you're a doctor, you're a healthcare professional, you are a lawyer, whatever job you do, you have a second job and that job is managing your finances. That's simply what reward means. And that radical responsibility means that even if you wanted to outsource your job to an accountant, you wanted them to help you with your books, you need some advice from a financial advisor to help you with planning your pension or your retirement or investment. Maybe you need a lawyer. At the end of the day, you are still in charge. So that does, that means I don't go and outsource your life to someone and say, oh, sort me out. Nobody's going to sort you out. You are your own chief financial officer. So once you understand that, the other rules make sense. Without number one, there's no need to look at the other rules. The others. <laughs> yeah. And tell me, and honestly, when I watched that video and I heard the first rule, that's something that um, I've lived by. And it's something that I preach to a lot of people. But I want to hear what is one way you've been able to apply that to your life? How are you able to be the chief CFO for um, Dr. Grimm's family? How, how, how are you able to do this <laughs> practically? Yeah. So, so from a practical point of view, so if you think about being the chief financial officer, what does your finance incorporate? You're looking at income, expenses, future income, future expenses. That's a simple way to look at it. Whether you call it investment, life insurance, lifetime ISA, um, pension, just think about it as income now, expenses now. That's present income, present expenses, future income, future expenses. That's how I look at it. So if I look at my income now, I'm looking at, okay, well, if I get income from my online uh, businesses I have online, from my e-commerce, from my dividends, from my investment, from clinical practice, if I get uh, income from rental property, those are income now. I look at my expenses, okay, have I got mortgage? And for those who've got rent, rent, if you look at it, you've got like car payment, um, whatever expenses you have, fortunately you haven't got that, but those are expenses. Now you look at future expenses, are there future expenses? What if I'm not able to work and I still need to spend money so I don't have income? So that's you looking into the future. Um, what am I investing? What if in the future I don't want to work as much as I'm working now? That's future income you're considering. So taking charge means that I, I sit down, for instance, in my own life, I look at 
an area like investment. I've been investing in the stock market since I was 18, 19. So that's me taking charge of my future income by investing in the stock market. Now, taking charge of my future expense, trying to reduce chances that I might spend more would be me buying insurance like things like um, not life insurance, income protection. If I don't have income, okay, that's still income. But if I buy insurance for my house, means that in case things spoil in the future, yeah. if my roof gets blown out, I'm covered. So sort of thinking about it from that point, you think about it from different aspects. You think about it from things like, um, apart from investment, your, you think about your savings. Are you saving in the best accounts that will give you the best returns? Um, you think about it from the point of pension. For instance, I'm not employed. I'm not like um, an employee. So I don't have like all these employee benefits like pension, which is fantastic. I mean, if you're a doctor and you're in the NHS, that's really good to have. But because I'm sort of like, I work for myself. So that puts me in a position where I have to also sit down, think about my pension. So taking charge of it from that radical point, I'm not thinking that someone is doing a pension for me anyway. No, I'm not deceived. Uh, I'm not going to leave my family to sort of like, um, even if I die now, um, I don't want to suddenly find out, oh, there's no money to pay for this. So that's why I have a life insurance plan. And that's why, mm. and um, you know, sort of just taking that sort of like responsibility. And it's not as difficult as most people make it. Most most of your audience, just like my audience, are educated. So they understand basic stuff. And um, a lot of time it's just giving it some time. If you give it some time every year to think about all those things. Um, yeah, so that's taking charge. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> I, think, I think I love that. Um, to put it in words that i think even though people would understand what you're saying they know how much they earn how much hits their account but they have no idea how much they spend and it doesn't have to be like you knowing the exact amount do we have extra that we are investing or we are saving for a future goal and stuff like that it could be something as simple as that that's something that is very practical in terms of you being the cfo so for anyone out there that is watching this and you have a budget, you're sticking by your budget and stuff like that. You're already doing the work of your own, <laughs> your own CFO, absolutely. which is, which is absolutely. good. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what CFOs do in companies, isn't it? They make sure yeah, that the exactly. company is financially <laughs> healthy. They keep an eye on the bottom line. They make sure that when the CEO comes in with ambitious, fantastic dreams, they say, hang on, hang on. This is going to hurt our bottom line. No, we can't afford that. Uh, and it's always the CFO that draws you back and said, hang on, is this a financially viable plan? And also the CFO helps to arrange finance. Sometimes CFO, just part of your role as CFO might also be how to increase your income and how to exactly. increase finance, yeah. how to, you know, basically. But 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 since you mentioned the dirty B word, I mean, <laughs> is... <laughs> a, a, lot, a lot of people call, call it dirty, but I just think it's um, one of those words that um, have negative um, rep to it. But yes. it's it's important yeah but, there, yeah but there are many ways to look at it i mean from someone like you i know basically that you're very organized and you have a budget and all that and there are people who can't really be disciplined to save money and they're this they could be disciplined in other areas they go to the gym and all that um but they can't save money so we tend to suggest um instead of budgeting to um save your 15 to 20 percent first yeah. Um, and I know that book, Richest Man in Babylon, will say save 10% or whatever. But we think like, because as a doctor, a healthcare professional, most times people start a bit later in life. And um, yeah. um, this is this is already one of the rules in terms of um, automatic saving. I think we call that like rule three, have an emergency fund is one of yeah. the rules. So um, rule four is actually set aside 15% of your income for retirement. So rather than um, most doctors and healthcare professionals start later, in their later 20s, to work so a lot of their um sort of like peers have started working having some pension set aside so you need to catch up and because you also have a decent income i mean it's not the ma it's not the highest income but you have a decent income you should be able to save 15 to 20 percent of your income so if you don't want to go into budgeting in details what you could do is to make sure um and we'll call that a mass so that's automatic uh, savings system so you make sure that the money is going out automatically so you set up a direct debit standing order whatever you need to do so that you don't have to be disciplined to save it once the money is hitting your account that 20 percent that 15 percent is already going out to a separate account that is not a consumer account it's only for saving investing into your future and of course when i mean say investing i don't mean you should buy some random 
MMM, crypto investment, um, yeah, without doing your due diligence. I mean, like really, really careful, well-studied investment. And if you don't know what to invest in, save your money first of all, understand how to save first and then start thinking about investing. Obviously, people say invest in the stock market, index fund, uh, S&P 500, which are all good real estate and all that. But I think most people try to jump from income to investment, which is good if you know what you're doing. But sometimes it's better to go from income, have that saving and then investment. That means you can develop an automatic and regular way to do it in such a way that it starts compounding rather than I just hit some extra money I'm going to invest. But if you do it in a systematic, regular way, um, I think it yields better dividends. Again, no play on, on words here, but it yields better dividends if you do it in a systematic way. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you.